Thanks very much. I was hoping to do some of the jokes today, but I think I... <laughs> Look, it is true, I, I did turn up at the uh, Kevin Rudd Summit. What was it called again? I forget. 2020 Summit, yeah. Um, I didn't want to go, and Anne and I had planned to be in the US, but I was asked because John Hartigan, who was then head of News Corp, rang me up and said, Jared, he said, I'm the head of this constitutional group. There are 100, pe 100 people on it, and 98 are lefties. He, he had on Philip Adams and David Marr and all this group. So he begged me to come along, so I did. Um, it was quite an experience. <laughs> and I didn't meet Kat, Kate Blanchett, although I did avoid <clears throat> the terrible situation where people um, stood up as Kevin Rudd sat on the floor. I'd never seen something quite like it, and they all bent over to listen to the great words of wisdom. Um, thanks for the invitation, and I don't want to go on too long today and promise to not go beyond an hour and a half. Um, <laughs> so congratulations to the Samuel Griffith Society on the occasion of attaining 30 years of age. It's difficult enough to set up a not-for-profit, privately funded voluntary organisation, but it's an enormous achievement to last for three decades with more to come. When I addressed the, the um, Society in Brisbane in 2018, I mentioned that I first met Ray Evans at Melbourne University um, in a previous century, but I'm not saying which one. And, um, and we knew each other for half a century. We agreed on many issues, we disagreed on some issues, but I always admired, admired Ray's enormous intellectual courage in setting up groups like the H.R. Nichols Society and the Samuel Griffith Society and others. Now, when I spoke to the Society in 2018, I mainly spoke about the media and religion and I did make reference to the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Assault. Um, and I criticised its focus on the Catholic Church and the Anglican Church. Uh, and I noted that it had no interest in such institutions as the media or government schools. Um, and I remember John and Nancy Stone were in the front row and at the end John asked a question and he was nice about my speech, which I appreciated, but he then raised the issue of George Pell, and I said, well, look, legal proceedings are on the way, there's nothing I can talk about, and I didn't. But I did speak about anti-Catholic sectarianism and anti-Christian secularism, uh, and my focus was on the ABC with respect to the, to the media, the Guardian Australia, what I call the Guardian ABC axis, um, and The Age and The Sydney Morning Herald. Uh, which brings me back to the topic of today's talk, the Pell case, the law and the media, which I've covered in considerable de depth in the book. Now, this is one of... You'd be surprised at this. This is the third of a trio. How about that? A trio of three. And... Um, <laughs> Keith Windshuttle's The Persecution of George Pell in Quadrant Books, Frank Brennan, Brennan's observation on the Pell, Observations on the Pell Proceedings, published by Connor Court, and my book. Now, we all get on pretty well, but what we have completely in common is we're all banned by the ABC. <laughs> and, and I haven't had my book discussed on any ABC program, nor has Frank Brennan, and Keith managed one. Yeah, on, a, on, a, on a low rating program and when they've got it up online they've got two articles attacking him so that shows you what that's like um, so we, we share that in common and so it's a band of honour. I wrote to David Anderson who's the managing director and so-called editor-in-chief of the ABC and to be fair to David he's, he's no better or worse than Mark Scott in that he doesn't really act as editor-in-chief in fact these days and I said to him look you're the editor-in-chief Perhaps you should get one of us on, you know. He didn't reply. I have a lot of problems with people replying to me, actually. It could be because I always publish their correspondence in media watchdog, <laughs> but I'm, I'm not sure. <clears throat> um, any rate, I now call David the ABC censor-in-chief, which is because uh, he's responsible for everything that goes on or doesn't go on the, prog on the programs and online and whatever else. Now... Before I start, I just want to endorse the statement of Cardinal George Pell that was issued on the 7th of April 2020, just after his convictions were quashed by a seven-zip decision 
in the High Court of Australia, which is just over two years ago, and he said, in part, I do not want my acquittal to add to the hurt and bitterness so many feel. There is certainly hurt and bitterness enough. And he was talking about the scandals in the Catholic Church and other institutions of child sexual assault of a, essentially of, a, of an historic kind. But the point was that George Pell did not, as he said, commit the awful crimes of which he had been convicted. And in the light of that, my comments tonight are directed at the Pell case alone. Now, without question, George Pell versus the Queen is one of the most important cases in Australian criminal law history, and Justice Mark Weinberg's devastating dissent in the Victorian Court of Appeal. I think it's perhaps the most important dissent in Australian criminal law history, <clears throat> particularly since the majority compri comprised Anne Ferguson, the Chief Justice of Victoria, and Chris Maxwell, the President of the Victorian Court of Appeal. So the question is, how did it come to this? Moreover, what does the Pell case tell us about Victoria Police, the Victorian Office of Public Prosecutions, the Victorian Director of Public Prosecutions, Victoria's suit and Victoria's two most senior judges? And what does it say about the media, with which, which with few exceptions, got the Pell case hopelessly wrong? And the answer lies in the performance, I think, of the Victorian legal organisations and the parlon mentality of so many Australian journalists, executive producers, and media managers. So I look first at the, the legal system and George Pell. Victoria Police. In March 2013, Victoria Police set up what was what is called Operation was called Operation Tethering to investigate whether any crimes committed by Pell had gone unreported. In other words, Victoria Police was looking for a crime before a complaint had been made. Now, on April the 9th, 2020, two days after the High Court decision, unanimous decision quashing Pell's conviction, Graham Ashton, the Chief Executive, uh, the Chief Commissioner of Victoria Police, was interviewed by Neil Mitchell on Melbourne Radio 3AW, asked why Victoria Police commenced an investigation on George Pell in the first place. Ashton replied, well, we received a complaint from victims. This statement is simply totally false. The only complaint which led to Pell going to trial was made in June 2015, over two years after Operation Tethering was established. And of course, Victoria Police laid 26 charges, only five of which got to court, and, and those, all five of which were crushed by the High Court. In, on 27th July 2016, the ABC 730 program devoted the entire 30 minutes to Louise Milligan's report, making an allegation about Pell's behaviour at the swimming, at swimming pools in, in, in Ballarat in the 70s and St. Patrick's Cathedral in the mid-1990s. Interviewed by Mitchell the morning after Milligan's report on 7.30, Ashton referred to the complainants against Pell as victims. This statement is completely unprofessional, totally prejudicial, and senior judges in England and elsewhere has warned that these comments shouldn't be made. A person who makes an allegation is a complainant. Once that allegation goes through the legal system, that person becomes a victim. To say that a person is a victim before the legal system has gone through is totally unprofessional. Um, now, Cardinal Pell agreed to be interviewed by Victoria Police on the 19th of October 2016 in Rome. Three turned up, uh, the, the um, Deputy Commissioner Shane Patton, uh, Detective Superintendent Paul Sher Sheridan, and Detective Sergeant Christopher Reed. Now, a study of the interview transcript reveals that both Reed and Sheridan were totally out of their depth, being either ignorant of aspects of the case, uh, including locations in Ballarat, which were, which were accessible by reference to a, to a, to a directory, um, and completely ignorant of practices of the Catholic Church, especially concerning the conduct of a solemn mass immediately after which Pell was alleged to have committed crimes. There were around 350 people present in the vicinity when the alleged crimes took place. Sheridan gave evidence before the Magistrates Court in March 2018. Early on, in response to a question from um, Robert Richter QC, Sheridan conceded that Operation Tethering could, could, he didn't say is, but he said he conceded it could be termed a get Pell campaign, which is an extraordinary statement from the very senior Victorian police in a Magistrates Court speaking under oath. In the event, Victoria Police laid only five charges uh, that got to a jury. Four related to Pell's alleged sexual assault of two boys, A and B, 
on one of two possible dates in December 1996. The prosecution didn't have a date. The fifth charge related to Pell's alleged assault on A, the first boy, in February 1997. Now, the second, uh, the second case, February 1997, Victoria Police admitted um, in the court under oath that the second incident was never investigated. So Victoria Police laid charges against Pell with reference to an assault which it admitted it was never investigated. They never saw witnesses, they never saw evidence, they never investigated it. Um, and in relation to this particular offence, uh, this following exchange took place in the magistrate's court. Why Father Regan, who said the mass, and Pearl was accompanying Father Regan on that occasion, he wasn't the principal, um, he wasn't the principal priest involved. Uh, and um, uh, he was asked why Father Regan, who was next to Pell all the time, hadn't been spoken to, whether this assault took place where Pell's alleged to, in a group of about 60 people in an internal procession, he goes from the back of the position standing next to Father Reed. He gets into the middle of the, of, of the procession. He can identify the boy he's previously allegedly assaulted two months earlier. And he grabs him and sexually assaults him for one second by grabbing his, his, his private parts and then comes back. Um, but they didn't speak to Father Egan, who would have been next to Pell all the time. And so the question was... Uh, so Christopher Reeves says, Fa Father, Regan hasn't, Father Egan hasn't been spoken to. And Robert Richter says, why? And Reed says, ah, I don't have an answer for that because I haven't spoken to him. Now, this is the kind of response which children are discouraged to use in primary grade. Namely, when the reply to the question, why did you do that, is because I did it. But we're talking here about a very singular... This is... Reed, Reed is the act, is, was the principal police involved who laid the charges under the Victorian legal system. Um, now, as a result of all this, I mean, a quite disgraceful performance by Victoria Police. Um, Patton, um, who was the deputy, was promoted by the Andrews Labor government to succeed Ashton. And so Patton, who led the delegation to Rome... Uh, is now the Chief Commissioner of Victoria. Now, Magistrate Belinda Wellington committed, Wellington committed Pell to trial on charges this, despite the prosecution's weak case, although she did throw out some charges. Now, even after the, um, even after the High Court decision, Ashton still said on a radio that he believed that the case against, the police case against Pell stood up well. So it's a bit like a sort of a game of um, what we used to call soccer, and you go down 26 well, and the coach says, well, we did pretty well on the day. I mean, that's what it's like. <laughs> now, after this, the um, Pell's case, um, for the second time, lodged an application for dis discontinuance because the evidence before the magistrate's court was so weak. That was rejected by the Victorian DPP, Kerry Judd. But she met her own particular Waterloo before the High Court when she took the case and couldn't explain what had happened. I mean, it's worth reading the hearings or the transcript of the hearings because it's very embarrassing. Now, alone among the mainline, mainland states in 2018, Victoria legislation did not allow for trial by judge alone. Um, and even if you'd gone, if Pell had gone by trial by judge alone, he might have been brought in guilty. If he'd run up against someone like Anne Ferguson or Chris Maxwell, he probably would have. But that's not the point. As, as Weinberg said, I think it was a kind of warning to his fellow judges, he said, juries don't have to give reasons, we do. And the case against Pell fell apart when Chief Judge Peter Kidd and the county court sentenced him <clears throat> and for the first time used the evidence before the court to give reasons for the length of prison sentence he was imposing because before that the case wasn't allowed to be reported because there was because there was said to be another case coming up against Pell, the swimming pool case, none of it was reported. So no one knew what had happened. And it was only when the sentencing decision came down after he was convicted that people realised that these, this reasoning of what the alleged had happened couldn't have happened. Um, but I'm, I've got a longer paper, and I won't go into all this now, but I've, I've got some... By and large, I think Chief Judge Kidd handled the case well, but there were some problems. For example, the ju Chief Judge forbade Richter from raising the issue of whether there was a Get Pell campaign before the jury. Um, and of course, he gave the right des description saying everyone should ignore everything I'd heard previously, but I mean, that's impossible. We're, we're now told 
in business, and we've got to be aware of unconscious bias, but it seems that unconscious bias stopped, stops at the jury door, and you assume that no one in, in a jury has got unconscious bias. Um, but, and, and also, um, there was, a, there was this suppression order, as I said, but the suppression order was broken while the jury was still impaneled. Uh, a Melbourne Press University Press, who had published Louise Milligan's, put out a, um, a media release saying she'd won a prize, and this had been commented on by Milligan herself, by a, a MUP Managing Director Louise Adler, um, and others including nine journalist Peter Fitzsimons, who I called the red bandana one, because for... Um, for a decade, he wore a red rag on his head. <coughs> I'm not sure whether he ever washed it. It's not sure. <laughs> it's not sure whether he slept in it. But whenever I saw him, he had it on. But he's taken it off now, and um, it might explain why. I don't know. Um, but even here, the chief judge was unaware of the extent of the suppression order because he said, "But my suppression order applies in Australia wide," but it didn't. It was only ever taken to account in Victoria. So you could, buy, you could buy Milligan's book at Sydney Airport, fly into Melbourne with the book, but the chief judge thought that he had a suppression order that stopped selling of the book all over Australia. All this I've documented in my book, which is full of these kind of quotes. Um, and now, on, in April, on, on April Fool's Day um, 2019, I emailed the, the Office of Victorian Public Prosecutions about the apparent breach of this suppression order concerning George Pell, and I just said, because at that stage uh, they were contemplating, and they did sue media for how it reported other aspects of the Pell case, and I said, well, what did you do about the suppression order? And I got back uh, a no comment answer. It actually said, we've got nothing to say about this. So there you go. Um, Victorian Court of Appeal was heard on the 6th and 7th of June, and this is how it started off. Christopher Boyce QC, who was the Crown Prosecutor, couldn't handle the case because I understand he's a very good barrister, but it was a pretty difficult case to handle. So it starts off like this. Ferguson, Chief Justice, could the, could the applicant be brought in, please? That's Pearl. Uh, yes, yes, Mr. Boyce, she says. And Mr. Boyce said, thank you, Your Honours. Your Honours, the complainant was a compelling, a very compelling witness. He was clearly not a liar. He was not a fantasist. He was a witness of truth. Whereupon President Maxwell said, Mr. Boyce, they are all conclusions. And Boyce says, yes, because that was the entire case. The entire case was the witness, the complainant was compelling. There was no other evidence. That was it. Um, now, of course, no one could explain how the, the event could have happened. Frank Brennan goes into this in great length in his book. Keith Winshuttle also handles it um, because the jury went in and looked at the, the alleged scene of the crime. But the jury went in, or both juries went in, because there was a mistrial and then a trial, and they went in at, um, they went in at one o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon, I think it was. Uh, solemn Mass in St. Patrick's Cathedral is replete with uh, priest, uh, the archbishop, the archbishop's attendants, altar service, choir boys, um, a large compl a complement of parishioners, and uh, a whole bevy of... Um, Taiwanese tourists who they used to, <laughs> on a Sunday, the tourist companies would bring the Taiwanese off the air, tourists off the airport. There's nothing much open in Melbourne on a Sunday at 11 o'clock. And they'd rock, they'd rock up at St. Patrick's Cathedral, some of them looking for the toilet, some of them looking around the place. And so they had a lot of people there trying to keep them out. Um, I mean, the place was, it would be a bit like sort of a crime takes place at the Sydney Cricket Ground on the, um, on the first day of the... Uh, of the January Test match, and you you investigate it by going out on a, on, a, on a Tuesday afternoon in the middle of July. I mean, there's just no comparison, at any rate. Um, then the Victorian government, after the High Court decision, the Premier said, "I make no comment about today's High Court decision." Seven zip High Court decision. Two of the seven judges were, were Melbourne-based. They were Victorian judges. He said, "I make no comment about today's High Court." decision, but I have a message for every single victim and survivor of child sex abuse. I see you, I hear you, I believe you. In which case, if that's right, if the Premier of Victoria was correct, there's no point in having trials. If everyone is accurate, if everyone's telling the truth, if no one's a fantasist, if everyone must be believed, then you should proceed from a charge by a Victoria police to a sentencing by the judge or a magistrate. I mean, that's the logic of that. 
but there wasn't much logic in the way Daniel, hand, Daniel Andrews handled this. Um, and Kevin Foley, a senior member of the Andrews government, launched Milligan's book in May 2017 when it was known that Pell was going to be charged. I mean, it's extraordinary unprofessional behaviour, which none of the media, the Melbourne Age, you know, the great bastion of, uh, of, of civil liberties, made no comment, the ABC made no comment. Um, and in the trial, the Crown Prosecutor made a claim for which no evidence had been tendered. It had to be withdrawn, but the jury heard it. Um, before, the, before the High Court, the Victorian DPP, Kerry Judge, attempted unsuccessfully to change the Crown's evidence against Pell. I mean, this is extraordinary behaviour. Um, I think the error made by Robert Richter, if there was one, Cardinal Pell thinks they won the case on the merits, but the merits, what were the merits? I think Richter misunderstood, didn't understand that the Queen versus Pell was not a normal legal case in which the Crown was required to convince a jury that the defendant was not guilty beyond reasonable doubt. It wasn't like that at all. The Queen versus Pell took place in a situation where the defendant had been subjected to some two decades of media hostility. In such an environment, it was almost impossible for Pell, Pell to receive a fair trial, and people were, were simply kidding themselves that they would. And in, in addition, there was the long-running Royal Commission, where evidence was given against Pell, to which, he, uh, which no one responded, and he wasn't there. Uh, and uh, those representing the Catholic Church cho chose not to respond, for reasons I explain in the book. Um, and the Royal Commission, in the end, came up with evidence that against Pearl, which said that it was inconceivable that he didn't know this, it was untenable, it was implausible. Uh, we all know that when you use words like that, they're using words as weapons for saying, this is a, my opinion. Because if something's unlikely, it's not a fact. And also, there was, I point out in the book, the findings are quite contradictory on two incidents against Pearl. He was denied due process, that's in the book. And the report even contained factual errors. I mean, Gerald Risdow, a notorious pedophile, been in prison since uh, 1996. Now, when he first went to prison, um, he got a year at the top, six months at the bottom. The Royal Commission had $350 million. It had, at any one time, hundreds of staff. And in the Royal Commission report, it says that in, in, in the first case that Ridsdale attended, which Pell, for reasons I explained, uh, walked him up to the court. He didn't give evidence, but he walked him to the, to the gate of the magistrate's court. Um, the Royal Commission maintained that he, got, didn't, he didn't get, serve a prison term after the first conviction. I mean, you only have to do a Google search to know that's hopelessly wrong. I mean, it's just completely unprofessional behaviour. Anyway, now to go and talk about the media, I, in my book, in my book, I mention over 100 people. When I first went on the Bolt Report to explain this, I had what I called my little list, sort of about Gilbert and Sullivan. So I had a little list, and then when people objected to it, I thought I'd better make it a bit longer. So here you see, here, down on the bottom, here, and all the way down there in small type in the names of all the media people in the parlour that I found. I mean, there will be others. There are authors, cartoonists, clerics, columnists, comedians, commentators, journalists, lawyers, former police officers, politicians, presenters, and publishers. And those of you who've been to London, you know the A to Z directory. Well, I've got one here. It starts off with Richard Acklin and it ends with Barney Schwartz. A to Z, the whole lot. Now, I'll just, I just look at a few of them. David Marr. Now, David Marr's book, The Prince, Faith, the, the Prince, Faith, Abuse and George, George Pearl, was first published in 2013. There's one book that can be judged on its cover because the use of the word abuse in the title indicated that the personal nature of, Pell, of Ma's book, at the time of publication, there was no evidence that Pella committed any acts of abuse on anyone. Now, it so happened that we appeared on Insiders when I was still invited on Sunday the 31st of May, and I'd criticised him the day before on the Saturday in my weekend Australian column about a comment he'd made about Pell. And... Um, when I, uh, when I got into the green room on the Sunday, I mean, he, he was really angry and he called me a lying shit and an effing shit. And all the while he was jumping up and down, I'm not exaggerating, he was jumping up and down like a young boy on a pogo stick. Except he wasn't a young boy and he didn't have a pogo stick, but you get, <laughs> you get the impression. And then I got to the office the next day, on the Monday, and I, 
uh, looked at the computer and it, it, a note from David. He said, I spoke to you yesterday harshly, he said, because I just wanted to remind you what, a, what uh, I'll give you, what he called a rich and full account of what a weird shit I think you are. Now, at that stage, I collapsed on the floor. <laughs> um, my executive uh, assistant, Lolita Mathias and Anne, um, kept running up and downstairs from the kitchen with wet rags, and they put them on my forehead. I, I've never really recovered from it, actually. Um, now, um, so if I'm a bit, bit edgy here today, you'll understand why. Um, now, Louise Milligan was interviewed by Virginia Trioli on the 27th of July, 2016, just when her book came out. Um, and she told, she, she told, Milligan told Trioli that Cardinal was written, quote, from the complainant's point of view. In other words, this is, an act of an, this is a book of an activist journalist. She, she refused to answer questions that I gave her. I sent, they're all listed in the book. She refused to answer. She got Louise, Milligan to send, uh, Louise Adler to send me a note saying that I should not ask her questions because, I, you know, that's all in the book. I mean, I couldn't believe it. Um, and then Milligan called me a vile bully and a pedophile protector. Now, I thought, you know, this was a bit odd for one of the ABC's most senior journalists, so I wrote to email David Anderson pointing this out, and I said to uh, David Anderson that I thought this was uh, a bit over the top, even for the ABC, and uh, so it's somewhere here, I don't know. <laughs> it's somewhere. At any rate, um, David Anderson said, I'll get back to you. Uh, <laughs> every day, because he, he, may, he may use mail, but every day... At about 10 o'clock, I go downstairs and see if the mail's arrived. <laughs> I, th I think I'll get an answer, uh, but I'm not sure where. Now, in time, Milligan won numerous awards for Cardinal, the Walkley Book Award, the Golden Quill Award, the Owen Dixon Chambers, I have to say in Sydney, Owen Dixon Chambers, the Australian Press Council Award. Uh, now, this, this, she got awards, literary prizes, legal prizes, the Australian Press Council Prize, um, and... This is an example, which I asked her about, which she never replied to. This is the evidence she used against Pell in her book. These are resources, among others. One senior member of a religious order. Another Royal Commission source. One of the most senior priests of the Courier in the Melbourne Archdiocese at the time. One church official, office, officials in the church. A friend who is a, who is a mother in the neighborhood. Someone who works around the Royal Commission, the father-in-law of an ABC journalist, people in New Pell in his Ballarat days, and the general many, many. Now, pray tell me. You a lot of lawyers here. You, you wouldn't know this. Could there be a source more authoritative, more authoritative than the anonymous father of an anonymous ABC journalist? Um, I don't think so. I doubt that very much. Now, it was Lucy Boris Ma. Um, who said when, when Andrew Bolt said that the journalists were cat conducting a witch hunt against uh, Pell, she said early on, when it comes to child abuse, I'm happy to be leading the witch hunt. That was another person who was supposed to be a dispassionate journalist reporting for the New Daily and CNN, but she was another activist journalist. She accused me of bullying, uh, implied that I brought, and implied where I brought about a, sit a, a situation where she had to call an ambulance. I've never been in that situation before, but I, I, I'd criticised her column and she felt the need to call an ambulance, so... Um, <laughs> it's possible she had lost the article and thought that, that the ambulance driver might have a copy of the column, I, I don't know. <laughs> she, made, she made accusations against Pell, um, which were totally fresh in, in the book Fallen, that came out after the Victorian Court of Appeal majority decision, but before the High Court. And... So in other words, she got it hopelessly wrong. So, but in, in uh, t November 2020, Lenore Towler, editor of The Guardian in Australia, which is part of the Guardian ABC Axis, as you know, announced that Fallen won the 2020 Walkley Book Award, despite the fact that the Pell's convictions had been quashed by a unanimous verdict of the High Court. Um, as Chris Mitchell wrote in The Australian, in one of his great media columns in The Australian, he said it was a bit like um, a half-time match report without a full-time score. <laughs> and he, he was right, uh, and announcing the decision, um, uh, Lenore Taylor didn't mention the High Court decision, which is pretty convenient. And then there was Melissa Davey, um, who, um, who said in discussion with 
David Marr, because all this group only ever spoke to one another. None of the group I'm mentioning to ever confronted anyone who was critical of their work. They only ever talked to everyone else at the ABC forums, at the literary festivals. And so in a discussion with David Marr after Melissa Davies' book came out, um, she said it was great that a, that a card cardinal, ultimately a cardinal sat in prison for almost a year in spite of the fact he was innocent. It didn't seem to affect her. This was before Glee Books. Uh, and in late June 2020, Scribe, which is uh, run by uh, my former university acquaintance, Henry Rosenblum, described Pell as an alleged offender. <clears throat> this was three months after he'd been acquitted by the anonymous verdict of the High Court. And then there's Sarah Ferguson, whose program, Goliath, is based on the evidence of a man named Bernie, who wouldn't give evidence before the magistrate's court, who withdrew his evidence, but she thinks he's compelling, in spite of the fact that the High Court has warned, both in civil cases and in criminal cases, that the concept of compelling doesn't work. Because someone might be compellingly telling the truth, or compellingly lying, or compelling, compellingly infused, confused. And so, um, so we go back to the problem where it all started, that a complainant is, is only as compelling as the evidence that he or she brings forward. So, in conclusion, as Frank Brennan said to me in a note he dropped me the other day, in spite of the whole disaster that's occurred in the Victorian legal system over this case and in the media, and not only in the media but particularly in the Melbourne media because Milligan's based in Melbourne, the Age is based in Melbourne, um, no one wants to talk about it. No one wants to inquire about how the legal profession, many of the legal profession, apart from the notable exception of Mark Weinberg, um, sorry, Mark Weinberg and uh, others, how they got it so hopelessly wrong and how the media got it so hopelessly wrong. But um, all of the stuff I've seen today, I've, I've fully documented in, uh, in what I wrote. And I think I'm half an hour's up, so I'd better stop. Thank you very much, uh, Jared. As I understand it, um, uh, attendees at this conference have been asking for somebody to speak on this topic for a number of years now. Uh, so I'm sure there'll be some questions from the audience. Uh, do we? Up oh, there's a the microphone. Yep. The back. Thank you very much, Jared. Sophie York. Look, um, where there's been such a system failure in the past, there is precedent for apologies, ex gratia payments. Um, inquiries into how to improve the system in future and what do you envisage will take place? What was the final thing you said? Inquiries into system improvement, ex gratia payments, apologies, etc. Well, you're never going to get an apology to Pell or the people who were criticised for supporting him because... The media, journalists rarely apologise, some do, but rarely do, and the ABC, as a rule, doesn't. And no one's going to admit they got it wrong. So I wouldn't expect um, anything at all. I mean, the interesting thing is that no one, in Victoria, as I understand it, I mean, it's not discussed. Um, I haven't been to Victoria, well, for ob obvious reasons, it was difficult to get into Victoria, but you, these matters aren't discussed in Victoria. Um, so I don't think anyone will apologise, and the people who've got the prizes. I, I mean, if I got a prize for a book like some of these journalists got, I'd be deeply embarrassed. Uh, and w w when I wrote to Louise Milligan, and I put the whole letter in the book, and she wouldn't, and she fled to a publisher. And my book on Santa Maria was published by, by Louise Adler of Melbourne University Press. And I wrote to Louise when she told me to back off, and the, cor the email correspondence in the book. And I wrote to Louise, and I said, "Well, look," I emailed her, and I said, "Look." When, if people criticise my San Amre book, I wouldn't think of rushing to Melbourne University Press and tell them to shut up. I'd, I'd answer it. You've got Milligan winning awards, and she couldn't even answer basic questions like, what's her attitude to hearsay? What's her attitude to memory? I'll give you one example, which I asked her about. She maintained that Pearl went to see this woman, um, this priest who, who had a sister in a house in a Melbourne suburb. And he wanted to say something confidential to this priest and his sisters. So he goes into this room, and she admits Pearl's very bright. So they go into this room, shut the door in a sort of a established Melbourne house, and the sister is in the bathroom between, and they're brick walls, 
And the sister maintained she heard this conversation, even though Pearl was trying not to let anyone hear it originally. And four decades later, she tells Milligan what she heard, and Milligan puts it in direct quotations. Now, Louise Adler reckons that's all right. Milligan reckons that's all right. All the people who gave her a award reckon that's all right. She'll never say it isn't. But it's grossly unprofessional. It's not journalism. Um, to put it, I mean, to put it, to say it was said, that's okay. To put it in direct quotes. And I said, well, what's your position on direct quotes? She wouldn't answer. So I've no idea. So I look, no one's going to apologise. Um, and no one will, I mean, they're all trying to hush it up. It, it is quite extraordinary that, I look, some people think I'm a bit tough. I mean, I don't know, but Fra Frank Brennan's a nice guy. I mean, you know, he's well brought up and all that sort of stuff. Uh, he's a bit of a liberal. He's, not, he's a critic of Pell on theological grounds. Frank couldn't get interviewed. So, I mean, maybe they think I'm a street fighter, but Frank, Frank's not. So, look, nothing will happen. So, there you go. But and I should say hi, Sophie. <laughs> Graham Haycroft, Jared. Um, I guess the key question, uh, Pell was found totally, effectively uh, innocent, uh, was found that it could not have happened at the time. The, the bloke who made all the accusations, one, uh, how come he's not being charged with perjury because if it didn't happen he must have made it up? And two, how come we don't get to find out what his name is having made the stuff up, whether he believed it or not, and he's uh, severely damaged uh, a very important man's career and his reputation? Well, I'm not saying that the complainant was a liar because... I've, doc I've documented this in the book in relation to quite sort of senior people in the back of the book. I mean, some people have clear recollections of events that never happened. This is not uncommon. So I'm not saying that the complainant was a liar. Under Victorian law, and I think the law in all, all, all Australian states, I think that's right, that the complainants in, in sexual assault cases can't have their names published. Um, Sometimes, even if they want to, but I mean, that's changing a bit. But if they don't want to, they can't. They can't be published. So now, all I would say is, in in Britain, where that guy Carl Breach Beach, who made accusations of sex sexual assault against the late Edward Heath and others, he was a liar. He was convicted of he's serving a long prison sentence. Now he was believed. Beach was believed by the most senior officers in the Vic London Metropolitan Police who said his, his, position, his position was compelling and convincing. And he lied about everything, completely lied about the lot, and he's gone down for about eight years. But you've got to prove that someone lied, and it's very difficult to prove that someone lied because you don't know. I mean, some people get confused, some people are fantasies, some people have memories of notes that, of matters that never, never happened. Some people are liars, so um, I can't say anyone's a liar, I have no idea. Um, the complainant's name was, was mentioned in the Victorian Court of Appeal by the, by the Crown, who made an error. Anyone in the courtroom on that day would have heard the name. Um, but you can't say anything about it. And Pearl doesn't want to go on about this. Um, and in a sense, Frank Brennan's made the point that the, the Victoria Police also treated the complainant badly because they should have brought him in, listened to his case, examined it, tested the evidence, and when the evidence didn't stack up, they should have gone back and said, look, this doesn't really work out, we don't, we're not sure this happened, and leave it at that. So, I mean, in a sense, he wasn't handled well either. Underneath it all, the prime responsibility here goes to Victoria Police, and the inability of Victorian legal authorities to handle it, and the enthusiastic uh, support for the Get Pell campaign by so many sections of the media, virtually none of whom was challenged. I mean, I've got a list in the front of my book about a few of us who stood up. There weren't many, and it was pretty tough, I must say, because you, you copped a lot of criticism. So, um, so you can't do anything about that. It's, um, but I'm not, I'm not blaming the complainant uh, in this book. I don't often mention the complainant. I'm blaming Victoria Police. It was a shocking case. And even after it, they're still defending it. And the bloke who ran it is now the Chief Commissioner. 
And it's not the others. It's not the only legal scandal of Victoria, as you Victorians and others know. I mean, the Lawyer X case. I mean, how many how many scandals have they got currently running? But this was this was a dread, dreadful one, which is which has damaged Victoria Police, has damaged and damaged the Australian legal system. And we have to be very grateful for Justice Mark Weinberg, in particular, and seven judges of the High Court have put an end to this. Because if that hadn't happened, even if it hadn't been seven zip, it would have been four three or something. That wouldn't have resolved the issue. The issue had to be resolved the way it was. So. Um, but that's the way it is. There you go. Do we have one, one more question here? If Thank you. Uh, a lot of public money gets spent on the ABC and the concerns that you have outlined raise questions that are systematic in respect of journalistic professionalism. Why is there not a board on the ABC and an editor-in-chief that will enforce proper professional standards? Mm. And what do we do about that? Well, I'm sad to say I don't think you can do much about it. Um, the, board, the board doesn't run the ABC. And, I mean, John Howard put people on the board um, Janet Olgerson was on the board, Keith Winshuttle was on the board for a period. Um, the board doesn't run the ABC, and nor should it. I mean, it does have an oversight role, um, and, and it should. And the, man and the board is appointed by the government, and as the chair is appointed by the government, and the chair is obviously chair of the board. The managing director is appointed by the board, including the chair. And there's also now a staff, a staff member on the board. So the key figure is the managing director, who is also supposed to be the editor-in-chief but never acts that way. Now, I'm critical of David Anderson, as I said. I'm also critical of Mark Scott and others before them. What happens is that the managing director... The, the, the ABC is a staff collective. It appoints its own, uh, promotes its own. Uh, it's a staff collective. I call it a Soviet. It's called the ABC Soviet, is what I call it. Now, unless you've got an editor-in-chief who is tough enough and knows enough to take on the various Soviets, you know, the various collectives, like 7.30 runs 7.30, Q&A runs Q&A, Insiders runs Insiders. You've got to get someone who can, has got the courage to take them on and the ability to take them on, which means you've got to be pretty brave, but you've got to know a lot as well. So it's a combination. And I can't think of anyone who's done it. But until someone does it, um, nothing's going to change. I mean, look at what's happened with 7.30. So Laura Tingle, who's on record as accusing the Morrison government of ideological bastardry without ever taking it back. Now, it was a late-night tweet, but I don't do late-night tweets because it takes up drinking time, but, um, <laughs> but she does. So she doesn't... Come the election campaign, she doesn't recuse herself. Uh, and managing director doesn't say you've got to step down for... I'm not saying Saka, but I'm saying recruit yourself. She doesn't do it. The managing director doesn't insist on it. She's chairman of the chair of the National Press Club, so if they did a debate there, she would be the interviewer. OK. So what happens is then um, Lee Sal steps down, so they go and appoint Sarah Ferguson. Now, there is nothing that L Laura Tingle and Sarah Ferguson would, would disagree about. And then the first thing that happens is, I've got this in my media watchdog on Friday. First thing that happens is that early in the morning, what I call hangover time, uh, that's how I divide the day. It's going to be about, you know, <laughs> so it goes hangover time, lunchtime drinks, gin and tonic time, dinner drinks and post dinner drinks, and hangover time. So, anyway, um, I, di I digress. <laughs> Uh, just to finish up, so then what happens, the first thing that happens at hangover time on Friday morning is that Laura Tingle sends out a tweet saying, Sarah Fergus has got the 7.30 job, isn't this terrific? So, I mean, they're all just sort of, they all live in the same group. And I used to notice when I used to go to Insiders when I was allowed on, but uh, they said I upset some of my fellow economists. I said, I think I disagree with them, but um, <laughs> I used to note that, that they all sort of, they all agree with one another on all these issues. And... So is this culture, and who could smash up the culture? Well, it would be a pretty brave man. It's not going to be David Anderson. So his term go, expires in, um, in about two years, but his appointment's appointed not by the government but by the board. So, look, it's a very difficult situation. 
But I like it, in a way, because it gives me something to write about. I mean, uh, <laughs> I need that. Anyway, I'm glad you all came along. Uh, I've got to go home and walk Jackie. I'm the male co-owner, and Anne, the female co-owner, is here after this. But I'll be back for the dinner. We'll be back for the dinner. But Jackie sends her regrets. <laughs>